the very foundation upon which the edifice of the Western esoteric traditions stand, and which resides at the center of monist theology and cosmogenesis as it relates to the operations, hierarchies, and techniques of Western ceremonial, is the Kabbalah. It is the scientific language of magic. I'm Ike Baker, and this is Arcanum. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines Kabbalah as, quote, esoteric Jewish mysticism as it appeared in the 12th and following centuries. Kabbalah has always been essentially an oral tradition. Esoteric Kabbalah is also tradition inasmuch as it lays claim to secret knowledge of the unwritten Torah, end quote. For clarification, the Torah is the written law or scripture of Judaic religious belief, We'll touch on this in more detail shortly. Let's first address the obvious, as this gives us a decent enough entry point into a discussion of the Kabbalah. What's with the spelling? When examining any tradition, study, or discipline that extends as far back in the historical record as, say, Kabbalah, and has been covered in as broad a section of culture and the world in general, there are bound to be a variety of different expressions of the spelling of certain words. This is particularly true when it has been translated and transliterated from and to several different languages. However, for all intents and purposes, the spelling has at this point become a way to distinguish between the different cultural contexts in which the Kabbalah is utilized and studied. Capital K Kabbalah refers most commonly to the Hebrew Kabbalah. This is essentially a particular mystical tradition of Judaism which was formalized in the 12th century and gained popularity among Jewish communities during the Middle Ages. However, it's currently used as a catch-all term for Jewish mysticism by laity. When we speak about capital K Kabbalah, we're usually talking about this particular manifestation of Kabbalistic tradition, which includes rabbinic lineages or schools of thought historically within formalized Judaism, and a specific set of tracts, texts, and exegetical analyses regarding Hebrew scripture. It should be mentioned that the term Torah is typically used to describe the five books of the law believed in Jewish tradition to have been delivered to the biblical figure of Moses. These being Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Bemidbar, and Devarim, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Torah can itself mean law or teaching, and is also referred to as the Pentateuch, which is derived from the Greek pentatuchos viblos, five penta tuchos, vessels, essentially five books. The Tanakh is an acronym or notarikon, more on this later, derived from the names of the three divisions of the greater part of Hebrew scripture, Torah, law, Nevi'im, prophets, Ketuvim, writings, Tanakh. Jewish tradition speaks of four levels of understanding Hebrew scripture. The first is peshat, or the literal understanding of a text. This is prerequisite to all other layers or levels of understanding. The second level is remez, which refers to a hint, meaning things which are not explicitly stated but alluded to by a manner of speech or analogy. The third level is drash, which is a sort of commentary or extended lore beyond the main scriptural canon, but existing as an integral part of it, as an elaboration of it. The entire literature of Drash is called the Midrash. The fourth and most esoteric level of understanding Hebrew scripture is Sod, meaning secret. This is deep insight and knowledge having to do with the nature of the universe, God, and humankind. This comprises the oral tradition, which we know as capital K Kabbalah. 
These divisions entail a much more nuanced approach to scriptural analysis and open a tremendous depth of exegesis based on much more than just a dead-letter interpretation. It is itself a lesson in expanding one's consciousness. The study of Hebrew Kabbalah is traditionally reserved for men, at least 40 years of age. Capital C Kabbalah typically refers to what is called the Christian Kabbalah. This at first sounds paradoxical, but calling to mind the nature of Christian history and theology, its emergence out of Judaism and reliance on Hebrew scriptures as backdrop and foundation for its own emergence, it makes a little more sense. For those perhaps unaware, the Old Testament section of the Christian Bible is the Hebrew scripture. Christians theologically consider themselves a development of Judaism and generally agree in its conception of monotheism and cosmogenesis, the creation of everything by a single God, the ensuing fall of humankind from a perfect state, and the covenant or pact with a chosen people. The patriarchs of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are in fact considered to be none other than the biblical personages of Adam and Abraham and their respective lineages. The main difference between Christian or capital C Kabbalah and the Hebrew Kabbalah is obviously the belief in the salvific reality of the Christ and the Trinitarian doctrine that developed in the Neoplatonic roots of early Christian schools of thought, as well as the application of various personages and powers central to the Christian story to the glyph or Kabbalistic diagram known as the Tree of Life. More on this later. Finally, we come to capital Q Kabbalah, or the Hermetic Kabbalah. This spelling comes from a transliteration, or the transferring of corresponding letters from one alphabet to another, of the Hebrew spelling of Kabbalah. Kof, corresponding to the English Q, Beit, corresponding to B, Lamed, corresponding to L, and He corresponding to H. This application of Kabbalistic exegetical analysis was formalized by the working magical orders of the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and its various offshoots. This extends Kabbalistic principles and cosmological narrative to a point of view within the individual through which they may examine the constituent aspects of material reality as well as their experience of it through the overarching lens of the Kabbalistic conception of the universe, which perspective ultimately reveals, typically with great insight, the underlying potencies or essences which formed and maintain it. As the name implies, it is intimately linked to Hermetic as well as Neoplatonic ideas. Along with Hermeticism and Neoplatonism, the Kabbalah is considered one of the three great keys of the Western esoteric traditions, particularly in magic. For this reason, I refer to it as the Magical Kabbalah. It was at this time that many of these ideas and philosophies were being picked up and re-examined to be framed in a magical context as a synthetic tapestry of the many philosophical and religious expressions comprising perennialism. But more about the magical Kabbalah later. Let's address one thing straight away. Has the Kabbalah been the subject of unfair cultural appropriation? Well, it depends who you ask. We come to a difficult consideration here because of the uniqueness of Judaism as a particular tradition and group of people. However, nearly everything in existence has been appropriated at some point. And a lot of good can clearly come from that. In the realm of spiritual culture as well, it's important to keep in mind that Christianity and Islam are outgrowths of Judaism, and Christianity in particular claims its roots in Judaic law and scripture. Ideas and systems of conceptualizing and approaching the divine are difficult things to lay sole claim to, particularly when we consider the fact that several central tenets of Jewish Kabbalah seem to be derivative, in a sense, of Pythagorean number mysticism. The practice known as isopsephy is an early Greek form of gematria, which is a predominant technique of Jewish Kabbalistic exegesis. The Hebrew word Kabbalah comes from the root kof beit lamed, kibel, which means to receive. Making the word Kabbalah literally means something like that which is received or 
reception. It has been continually averred that the Kabbalah, its method and doctrines, existed long before the written law. An unwritten law also existed in ancient Greek thought. A Platonic oral tradition is made mention of explicitly by Aristotle in the words agrafa dogmata, literally the unwritten doctrine. For those interested in researching more on this concept, I recommend you consult Kieran Barry's The Greek Kabbalah, Alphabetical Mysticism and Numerology in the Ancient World. So aside from this conjecture of who did it first, ultimately the Judeo-Christian conception of the creation of the universe and humankind in particular avers unequivocally one humanity. Finally, we should consider that it is by cooperation, exchange, and development that we as a species have been able and are able to continue to progress. This is evident in everything from language, food, and technology to biological evolution. To stunt exchange on the fallacy of cultural appropriation is to reject the very meaning then of progress. Before we move on to the history of Kabbalah in broad strokes, we should mention that while we most often associate Kabbalah as Jewish mysticism, it's important to note that there were other forms of Jewish mysticism which preceded it, at least according to historical record, one such example being Merkava mysticism. That said, let's move on to when and where, as far as we are able to tell, the Kabbalah was committed to writing. The writings most identifiable as the origin of a Kabbalistic literary tradition come from 12th to 13th century Spain and France. Though it is believed that many Jews had migrated to the Iberian Peninsula after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, it was during the 12th and 13th centuries, a period of Christian ascendancy after the Moorish and Islamic rule of southern parts of Spain, that there was more leniency toward the extant Jewish communities, particularly by King Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile. During the 1300s, Jews owned real estate and held public office. This set the stage for a stable, growing population. It was in this era and milieu that Moses of Leon penned the foundational text of Kabbalism, the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of Splendor, Zohar for short. Though he pseudo-epigraphically attributed the ideas contained in the Zohar to the Rabbi Shimeon ben Yochai, a rabbinical authority of the first century CE, modern scholars universally reject this idea and believe the Zohar to have been written by Moses of Leon himself. After his death, there's a tale that tells of his wife selling his works to a man of Avila. And when asked why he had attributed the works to the Rabbi Shimeon, his wife answered that Moses had once commented that in doing so, they would be, quote, highly honored and would also be a rich source of profit. We are talking about hundreds of years worth of grapevine-style conjecture here, so who really knows? The Zohar itself is actually a work of several volumes, focusing on mystical commentary, or a midrash, on the Torah, the first five books of the law revealed to the biblical prophet Moses. It is highly mystical in that it comments on the creation of the world as emanations from the Godhead, and lays out the nature of God, referred to as the En Sof, the endless or boundless one in the form of ten sefirot. The word sefirot is the plural of the word sephira, which some have chosen to read as bowls or emanations, yet the word sephira has a close and telling relation to the idea of number, as it can be translated as enumeration or counting. Another core concept in the Zohar is the idea of an interior and an exterior reality in all things, and a conception of the material as a series of emanations or countings from the one by and through which human beings can ascend toward enlightenment or consciousness of the One. This system is reminiscent of the Neoplatonic idea of the ascent through the spheres of causality which we covered in episode 4, The Myth of Ur. A massive work, the Zohar is essential reading for any would-be Kabbalist and or occultist. At this point we should include two more terms to be defined, so that we're all well-rounded enough to perhaps superficially discuss Hebrew scriptural history. The Mishnah and the Talmud. The mission is the first written record of the Hebrew oral tradition, compiled in the second century CE. Though it is a compilation of the oral tradition, what sets it apart from the Kabbalah is the mystical exegesis inherent to the Kabbalah. Whereas the Mishnah, literally meaning that which is studied repetitiously, was used primarily to just that end. The Talmud is another written record of commentary in the form of a Hebrew oral tradition. 
There are two divisions of Talmudic literature, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud predates the Babylonian by about 200 years and is written in Aramaic. The Babylonian Talmud, which is the collection of commentaries most typically associated when we say the Talmud, were compiled between the 3rd and 6th centuries CE, primarily in the major Hebrew cultural centers, which were then in Mesopotamia, within the Babylonian Empire. An earlier origin of Kabbalah may very well come from the second of its foundational texts, the Sefer HaYetzirah, or Book of Formation. Scholars to this day debate the dating of its origin, some placing it in the early Middle Ages and other as far back as the Talmudic period of the 2nd century CE. This text, however, has no critical text written on or about it and therefore cannot be dated for as long as this piece of corroborating evidence is missing from the historical record. The Sefer Yetzirah deals with the creation of the universe by God through the agency of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and their relation to the act of creation as particular creative potencies in themselves. The Sefer Yetzirah also expounds an elemental sequence of creation from the divine and a tripartite division of the creation as the universe, time, and humankind. It also subdivides the 22 letters into a 3, 7, and 12. It relates the three to the three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, as air, water, and fire, respectively. To the seven double letters, having two sounds and representing natural contrasts, it attributes the seven visible planets of antiquity. Significantly, these very planets, or archons as they were known in early Gnostic schools of thought, were thought to be syzygies, or pairs of male and female. To the twelve, the twelve simple letters are assigned, and the signs of the zodiac, the matzalot. Significantly, the Sefer Yetzirah also delineates 32 paths of wisdom, the 10 Sefirot and the 22 letters, which are given specific names and attributes as intelligences. For want of being able to delineate its entirety due to time constraints, a few of its main themes are the mechanisms of creation as permutations of elemental forces and the arising duality or polarity of contrasts in nature. The Sefer HaBahir, or Book of Brightness, is an anonymous text which tradition dates to the 1st century CE. Comprised of 200 aphorisms, it is a mystical reference and midrash of the Torah, and is considered a foundational text of Hebrew Kabbalism. Its first mention comes from southern France in the 12th century. Highly relevant to later developments of Kabbalistic philosophy, another key concept related in the Zohar is the idea of a flaw in the divine architecture of the universe. This is expressed by the exile of the Shekinah, or the light of the divine presence, usually characterized as feminine in nature. This flaw and the exile of the Shekinah, according to the Zohar, can only be repaired by the messianic, Meshiach, meaning anointed in Hebrew, act of tikkun, literally meaning repair. The Zohar states that tikkun can be affected by performing good deeds, following the Hebrew commandments, and studying the law, or Torah. This concept became important to a later successor of Leon's, Rabbi Isaac Luria. Luria's influence being in the eastern Galilean town of Safed during the 16th century, he left paltry little in the way of personal writings and claimed that his spiritual insight came from conversing with the souls of long-deceased Jewish mystics that came before him. However, Luria's student, Chaim Vital, left a substantial version of his teachings. Luria's insight was related to the Zoharic conception of this divine flaw in the emanation and the necessary repair, tikkun. His idea was that the infinite undertook a cycle of rarefraction and compression or expansion and contraction of itself in order to create space in which the universe could be created. He called this Tsimtsum. During this state of oscillating expansion and contraction, the essences or emanations of the sephirot, conceptualized as types of vessels or bowls in this instance, and a beam of divine light began pouring into the space being created. The vessels or bowls of the sephirot were unable to hold this divine light as it poured into them with such great force that the vessels shattered. And this was the first failed creation. The shards, or klipot, which the broken vessels resulted as, 
are the shattered pieces of the divine which comprise our material world. Within these broken shards remain sparks of the initial divine light, the Shekinah, trapped as it were, in this broken and fallen state. According to Luria's conception, not only were God's people and God's light, but the divine presence, God itself, was trapped in the material Galut, exile. Regarding this conception of creation, there are two schools of thought. The first being that we still live in the first failed world of broken shards. The other being that there was a first creation and a second one was made in which the Sephiroth were indeed able to bear the divine light and we live upon the rubble of the first failed creation, so to speak. From there, Luria's doctrine takes on a messianic message of tikkun, repair and redemption, a restoration not only of the world, but a releasing of a part of the divine itself from entrapment in the material, of significance upon the contraction of the divine light in the Tsimtsum, four, sometimes five, olamot, or worlds, are emanated, and the first of these is called by Luria Adam Kadmon. In the Lurianic conception, the four worlds are really four phases or stages of downward descent of the divine. The name or term Adam Kadmon is first found in an early 13th century Kabbalistic treatise called the Sod Yediat Hametziut. In the Zohar, divine wisdom is called Adam Hagadol, the great man. The Olamoth, or worlds, are each given to a letter of the unpronounceable name of Hebrew deity. Yahweh, or yod Hey vav Hey. The Hebrew letter Yod is given to the archetypal world of Atsilut. He is given to the creative world of Bria. Vau to the formative world of Yetzira. And He final to the physical world of Asya. These names in turn are derived from the Hebrew book of Isaiah. Everyone that is called by my name and for my glory, I have created. I have formed, even I have made. Atsiluth meaning emanation, Bria meaning creation, Yetzira meaning formation, and Asya meaning making. After Luria and informed by his doctrine of Tikkun Ha'olam and the Mashiach or coming Messiah, a period of messianic proclamation was endeavored by an eccentric Turkish Jew known as Shabbatai Tsevi. This was, however, a brief proclamation, though worth mentioning, and his apostasy followed shortly after. Hasidism was the final form of Lurianic Kabbalah as a mass movement within Judaism, founded by the Baal Shem Tov, or owner of the good name, a monk-like itinerant mystic who taught that all Jews whether of the rabbinic class or otherwise, could achieve spiritual enlightenment and rejected the traditional Jewish religious establishment. Upon gaining large numbers of followers in several different communities, a sect known as the Tzadikim, or Righteous Ones, came to prominence. Their core theology came to intimately embrace Lurianic ideas of Kabbalism, particularly the Klipot, Tikkun, and the Shekinah. During the 19th century, Kabbalah began to be phased out as a viable system of mystical Judaism, yet regained prominence in the 20th century by way of its academic study and classification as an integral part of Judaic tradition. The works of Israeli philosopher and scholar Gershom Sholem are most exemplary of this. Another early Kabbalist and mystic of significance was Abraham Abulafia. The time constraints of this video obviously prevent us from covering the entirety or in any real depth the labyrinthian subject of the Hebrew Kabbalah in and of itself, but I highly recommend the video on the 13th century founder of the School of Prophetic Kabbalah done by Zev of the channel Seekers of Unity. His work on the Kabbalah in general is top notch. I've included a link to his video in the section below this video. During the Renaissance, Kabbalah, along with many other ideas propounded as ancient, at that time, came to the forefront of examination by philosophers, mystics, and intellectuals, many of whom were devoutly Christian. As a response to this supremely mystical yet intellectual conception of the universe, the one, and humankind as comprising one interrelated network of being, mentally navigable by means of certain glyphs and esoteric understandings of numbers and letters, Christian mystics and commentators took to applying the principles of Kabbalah to their own understanding of theology and cosmology. 
A few of perhaps the most influential Christian Kabbalists were the Florentine Italian philosopher, scholar, and protege of Marsilio Ficino, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, the German Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher, the German Catholic humanist and scholar Johannes Reuchlin, and the German scholar of Hebrew Christian Nor von Rosenroth. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, or Pico as he was known, was a great popularizer of the Jewish Kabbalistic works among Christians. As a close friend and student of the Renaissance scholar and translator to the Medici dynasty, Marsilio Ficino, Pico was fortunately poised to interpret these works as he understood some Hebrew and Aramaic. Pico also engaged in an apprenticeship in the Hebrew Kabbalah with an Italian rabbi, Yohanan Alemano who placed special emphasis on what he termed magic. In fact, in Pico's major work, The 900 Theses, he remarks that, quote, Christianity's truth is best demonstrated by the disciplines of magic and Kabbalah. He believed Kabbalah to be an ancient esoteric lore, conserved by the Jews, at the heart of which was the Christian message. Kabbalistic magic would be a central theme in Pico's work. Pico claimed to have uncovered and expounded an esoteric or interior analogy of the emanations of the Divine One in the images and mythologies of the pre-Christian pantheons. Pico was perhaps one of the first in historical record to believe in an underlying perennial wisdom tradition, concealed here in the Kabbalah. Consonant with the Zoharic idea of the ascent through the Sephiroth to the Divine, Pico believed the Kabbalah to conceal in its interior recesses a methodology, a practice of of ascent. He placed emphasis on the importance of divine speech in Hebrew scripture. It was by speech that God first created all things. Ultimately, Pico died young and published very little. However, of the 900 theses comprising his major work, 119 were Kabbalistic ideas. Another scholar contemporary with Pico, and having made his acquaintance, was Johannes Reuchlin. Like Pico, Reuchlin believed the Kabbalah to be an esoteric doctrine, concealing the perennial wisdom of all ages and all religions, ultimately culminating in a species of underdeveloped esoteric Christianity. This idea was best expressed in his De Verbo Mirifico, the miracle working word. After De Verbo, Reuchlin would return to and build upon his Kabbalistic work 20 years later with De Arte Kabbalistica. In this work, he regards Kabbalah as a defense of Christianity a polymath who published at least 40 major works in his time. Athanasius Kircher was a strong proponent of Kabbalah as pertaining to what he called the hieroglyphic doctrine. He believed the Egyptians and Hebrews to have been in such close relation regarding their esoteric doctrines and religious beliefs that he once remarked, the Hebrews have such an affinity to the rites, sacrifices, ceremonies, and sacred disciplines of the Egyptians that I am fully persuaded that either the Egyptians were Hebraicizing or the Hebrews were Egypticizing. In the second book of his Oedipus Egypticus, he inserted a 150-page treatise entitled The Kabbalah of the Hebrews, dealing with the mystical nature of the Hebrew alphabet, the Kabbalistic divine names, and what he called the Natural Kabbalah. Kircher's inclusion of several intricate and beautiful diagrams has marked his work with a unique character. We receive a detailed and famous depiction of the Kabbalistic glyph of the Tree of Life from his works. Lastly among our examination of the Christian Kabbalists, we come to Christian Nor von Rosenroth. After devoting his life to the study of the Hebrew language, he became a student of the Kabbalah. Rosenroth's concept of Adam Kadmon, the first or archetypal man, was that it was the Christian Jesus. He also correlated the first or uppermost three sephiroth, referred to as the supernal triad, to the Christian trinity. His significant work in the realm of Christian Kabbalism was his Kabbalah Denudada, or Kabbalah Unveiled, which contained his preliminary studies of Kabbalah as well as several tracts and essays in several volumes. This would profoundly impact the later transmission of Kabbalistic philosophy into the 19th century with its partial translation by Sam Little McGregor Mathers in 1887. As many of you probably already know, not only did this make the work accessible during the fin de siècle spiritualist and occult movement, but Mathers was himself one of three founding members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. This brings us for all intents and purposes to the modern interpretation of Kabbalistic philosophy. 
It primarily resided throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries in the realm of esoteric and occult circles and salons, and in the deepest recesses of Freemasonry. Among others, including Anna Kingsford, founder of the Hermetic Society with whom Mathers trained and exchanged ideas and discourse, another founding member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was an avid Kabbalistic researcher, William Wynne Westcott. In midlife, Westcott took a two-year temporary retirement in order to devote himself to the study of the Kabbalah. He recruited Mathers, several years his junior, a promising mason with a voracious intellect, to complete this translation of Nor von Rosenroth's Kabbalah de Nudada. The two went on to form the basis of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's signature, Hermetic Magic, on the framework of the Kabbalah, synthesizing rituals, curriculum, and a complete philosophy of spiritual rectification, taking again the Kabbalistic perspective of the Edenic fall from the preceding traditions of Kabbalah and the literature available to them at their time. From the dissemination of this version of Kabbalism and its practical application, developed through the years by Golden Dawn initiates and offshoot orders, we arrive at the Hermetic Kabbalah which we have inherited by way of these magical orders and the works and writings of their initiates and founders, chiefly and most especially the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. <laughs>